because not one person closes the door. She just runs out of the house and doesn't close the door. and crones hey hags and crones hey maniacs <laughs> hey maniacs this is midsummer maniacs midsummer maniacs is a recap podcast dedicated to the itv series midsummer murders each week we look into an episode of the show including the murders the mayhem the loonies and everything that's on the wall behind them including hags and crones hags and crones <laughs> just a little warning if your kids uh find the show too much they're probably not ready for the podcast but this is pretty uh pretty tame episode oh i don't know there's buckets of blood uh, <laughs> squirt 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 <laughs> a less scary beheading i don't think you could make yes you certainly know? less scary than the other beheading <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Midsummer the, bikes, Rhapsody, the motorcycle beheading, which I always think is in death in a chocolate box, which is the next episode. I love when his head shoots off. Boing. Not so with this one. They fall into a nice little basket. They do. A couple of things off the, t- the top. First of all, a number of our uh, maniacs pointed out that last week we mentioned the golden hind and we said it was hound. We were I, wrong. I, I said it was a hound, and I was wrong. I trusted you. You did. I believed you. I led you astray, almost like a deer in the woods. See what I did there? Except, no. Okay. So a hind is a deer. Hind is a female deer. Thanks, maniacs. So a doe, kind of. A deer. Yeah. A female deer. A female deer. <laughs> couple of things this week also uh season 22 has not only been rehearsed but filming has begun hey that's good news so that's very good news i'm happy for all those people on set who needed to go back to work and i hope that everybody's safe on set and uh that we get episodes soon now i don't know i don't understand why the last two episodes of season 21 have not been shown in england you poor english people i'm sorry they're great episodes but i don't know why we get them and you don't i don't understand that either no something to do with like is is a sanely popular show so maybe they save them so that they could use them later to boost their ratings i don't know itv's got them in the can Somewhere over there. It's just so us Americans can say neener, neener, neener. We've seen them and you haven't. Sorry. And that wouldn't be very nice. Yep. So we wouldn't say that, right? No. <laughs> Except they just did. Uh, speaking of TV, uh, we have an acorn thing coming up. We do. If you're a, a Midsummer Murders lover and you don't happen to be an acorn subscriber um, and you need a place to watch them other than pirated youtube videos we have an acorn code that will be from the main summer maniac yes they kindly partnered up with us for a post that's going to come out tuesday tuesday tomorrow. october 6th yeah um so watch our instagram and our twitter feeds yep uh if you need a little discount code um but along with that post we have, what, 10 shows that we recommend on Acorn? Eight, 10? Yep, 10. Uh, of our favorite shows. So even if you are an Acorn subscriber already, check out the list of shows. They're not all British murder mysteries. We tried to put together kind of a variety of a list. So have a look. Yep. And uh, just as a reiteration of our policies, it's not like uh, we get a benefit every time you use this code or anything no, no, like no, that. No. no, no. This is like a one-time thing. They approached us and we said, we love Acorn anyway, so we might as well do this thing. Yeah. Well, and it was a way to kind of point out some other shows that we think our audience would like. They were exceptionally cool about everything. Mm -hmm. So Acorn sent us email. We were rather excited. It turned out to be a single post, but hey, it's a start. It's a start. Soon we'll be famous. Soon. I'm hoping to get news from... uh, the set. That's personally what I want to do. Yeah. So, uh, and also on the 30th of September, 
a number of people posted about our podcast. Thank you so much because it was uh, International Podcast Day. Galactic Podcast Day. <laughs> getting podcasts from Mars, yeah. I guess. And some folks who posted to recommend their favorite podcasts. A few of them mentioned us and yep. we appreciate it. And um, we thought we would return the favor uh, here at the top of this episode to recommend a few podcasts to you that you may have not heard of. So I am an utter podcast junkie. Yes. Almost everything I do, I can do while listening to something. Poor Mark. He does so much audio and visual stuff that he can't listen to something while he's working. (laughs) I get to listen to podcasts on my walks and stuff like that. But But I I probably listen to three audio books a week, as well as uh, probably 12 hours of podcasts, I would guess, at least. And uh, I wanted to put together a little list of podcast recommendations that are all British. They all have to do with uh, murder. Okay. But they're all fun. Oh, okay. So no... Scary, creepy, dark, serial killer, true crime stuff. We've been watching too much Vandercliff or Cleef or whatever. Vandervalk? Vandervalk on the the BritBox. Yeah. Like, I I like true crime podcasts, but right now I'm leaning towards things that make me laugh. Yep. And so I wanted to give folks a list. So I've got um, two two parts to my list. I've got four fiction-based podcasts and four non-fiction-based oh, podcasts. Okay. And we're going to include all of these with links in the um, episode notes. So you don't have to like pause this and try to write these down or figure yep, out how to spell them. They're all in the show notes. Don't worry about it. Yep. Um, and of course, if after I read my list, if you have more that you would like to recommend that are along the same vein... British crime, but fun. We hope that you'll um, reply and let us know yes. your recommendations. So here we go. Sarah's pod crime funny podcast recommendations. Are you Excellent. ready? Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that your musical flourish. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so my four fiction podcasts in no particular order: the Pogglywood Murders. Fantastic podcast. It's produced by the 368 Theater Company. It's a a murder mystery set in 1937 at a country estate, like in a small village. If you like Poirot or, I mean, really any British mystery set in the 30s and 40s. It is, and it's so funny. It's, it's dramatized. Funny. It's a full, a full theater troupe that does yep. all the voices. They do sound effects. It's really good. Pogglywood yep. Murders. Yep. My second recommendation is the Supernatural Housewives of Bally Strange. Oh. Which is read by the same gent who wrote them. His name is Brendan Brethnock. I'm going to say, I'm sorry, Brendan, if I butchered your name. It's about a, a small coastal town that has been cursed so that all the men in the town must marry women who are actually demons. Oh. And it's super, super funny. Okay, cool. So it's like supernatural, but there's a murder mystery and there's a cop who's new to town and he has to solve the mystery and it's very fun. So that that's the, fun. the supernatural housewives of Belly Strange. Nice. And then my last two fiction uh, recommendations are both productions of Long Cat Media. The first one is Mockery Manor, which is, again, a fully dramatized podcast about um, it's set in a 1980s British theme park oh. where there are murders. Yes. It's got awesome music in it that's like from the period and uh, the folks who make it also make the music. It's super fun. It's light, but it has some creepy moments in it. It's it's kind of fun. Um, And then the same folks at Long Cat Media also produce another podcast called Madame Magenta Sonos Mystica. So Sarah's played a couple of these for me and they're riotously funny. Like... I laugh so hard that the kids look at me kind of strange because yep. they don't know what I'm listening to. Yep. <laughs> the kids look at me strange all the time. anyway. But. So those are my four fiction recommendations. Excellent. My four nonfiction recommendations. Yes. Of course, we start with Love Joy. Actually, we love those ladies. We love their show. They are fantastic. They recommended us. They are, they are just the sweetest ladies out there. Yep. They've they're got a little bit nice. of an edge sometimes. They, they do. can be fun. They do. They may they're have so a little fun. bit of wine while they're recording. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do like the wine. So if you like Love Joy, check out Love Joy Actually. Yep. My second recommendation is a podcast called Murder Mile, um, and it's hosted by Michael J. Buchanan Dunn. And so Michael started as a tour guide in London. Okay. 
walking people around the square, the the mile of the city of London. Now doesn't he do YouTube videos too? Yeah, he does, but much more podcasting than anything else. Okay. And so all the podcasts are presented as if you are on, on an immersive walk in London. Oh, super You hear cool. the sound effects of the street of the era when the murder happened. Oh, that's super cool. And it's almost like you're there. That's so cool. If you've been stuck in the house and you you want to feel like you're in London walking around in history, uh, I recommend Murder Mile. Plus, Michael's very funny. I don't know if he always means to be funny, but he is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> very tongue in cheek sometimes. So that's my second recommendation. My third nonfiction is This Paranormal Life, hosted by Rory Powers and oh, Kit Greer. They are fantastic. It's not a murder crime show. It's about the paranormal. But oh my gosh, they are hilarious they are some funny dudes every episode they present some kind of paranormal mystery and at the end they decide whether it's paranormal or not and yeah. just endlessly funny and those are, two guys it's, they are so fair they yeah, are they're they very are. fair and stupid funny yes and then the my last recommendation is the only one that isn't an independent kind of podcast it's a, a bbc radio 4 pad, podcast called you're dead to me and it's hosted by Greg Jenner, who was one of the advising historians on horrible histories. Oh, nice. So he's really funny. Yeah. And You're Dead to Me, what he does is he brings a historian who's a specialist in a topic and a comedian who knows very little about that topic. And the, the three of them talk about some historical event or person from history. And it's super fun. That's super good. If you haven't watched Horrible Histories... It's a kid's show. I think it's on Hulu in the U.S. Yeah. But if, it's we, hilarious. if you watch horrible <laughs> histories, you have to watch this show called Ghosts. Yeah. It's all the same actors. All the same actors. But for grownups. But it's incredibly funny. Yeah. Very, very funny. Yep. So those are my eight recommendations for podcasts. That Excellent. Are British and crimey yet fun. And if you've got more, please uh, reply to us and share them with us. On to 58, season 10, episode 7, They, they seek, seek Him, him here. here. Or, as I like to call it, the cavalcade of people who have been on the show already. Yeah. Or, which red herring are you interested oh, in? jeez. This show, filmed in January, February 2007, released t April 27th, 2008. 7.98 million views. We were just talking about this. We would have moved to Bloomington by the point that this was broadcast. Yeah. Yep. Would have been That's, about the same time. Isn't that know, crazy? It seems so recent. Directed by Sarah Hellings, who's directed a bunch of the episodes, and written by Barry Purchise. This is one of those fun episodes of a show that's about filming something else. Yes. Where they're like, they're on a set, on a set, on a set. It's all meta. And they're filming the Scarlet Pimpernel. And these kinds of episodes of shows, I'm always looking around to say, to think, is that actually an extra pretending to be somebody on a set? Or is that somebody from the actual show crew that they just said, hey, can you get in front of the camera and walk across real quick? Did you notice there's a shot, a really long shot of a guy with a boom microphone? I, that guy, ha they have to be like, oh, that's Bill with the microphone. Yeah. Get him in the shot. <laughs> There's a lot of those moments yep. in this episode. But we begin in the French Revolution. Yeah. Ba -ba -ba. We don't know where we are. Yeah, we don't, it's a flashback. Vive la France, right? The flashback. And uh, we have somebody being led to the guillotine who really doesn't want to be led to the guillotine. No, he doesn't. His legs go all jello. Oh, baby, baby, don't do that. <laughs> no, no, oh, no. His legs are all like wibbly wobbly when they're trying to take him out there. Yep. Like they're going to say, oh, well, if you can't walk, never mind. So we'll he let goes, you free. He's up under the guillotine. <laughs> the, the, off with his head. Off with his head. The blade comes down. Oh, it's just a move. The crowd cheers. Yay. Including and then they the kind of laugh lady. at the beheading. It's, yeah. Beheading is fun. <laughs> now, later in the episode, not so much. So the title, they seek him there. They seek him here. They seek him here is from uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Yeah. They seek him here. They seek him there. Those Frenchies seek him everywhere. Those Frenchies. Is he in heaven or hell? Or is he in hell? That damned elusive Pimpernel. It's a pretty good little rhyme. Yeah. The, so Scarlet Pimpernel is written by, what's her name? 
Orkney. Baroness Ortsy. Ortsy. In she 1905. Was Hungarian. Okay. In 1905, originally it was a stage play that was really popular in England. So she turned it into a novel, sold a bunch of books. She wrote a lot. Yeah. There are 18 Scarlet Pimpernel books. Yep. Now they're not long. But there are 18 of them. She was also a painter, and she wasn't too bad. She is a busy lady. Yeah. But the problem I have with this, of course, is he's saving the aristocrats who are like, yeah, they were the nice guys in the French Revolution. Not that there was anybody who was nice, but... No, no. But the Scarlet Pimpernel's wife was French, right? So that's why he was... She was a French aristocrat. He was saving her and her friends and family or whatever. Yeah. She, uh, Madame Ortsy invented the hero who has a secret identity. Yes. She's the first one to ever write that. And as I There would be no Batman if not for the Scarlet Pimpernel. There is no Batman without the Scarlet Pimpernel. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't like Batman. How can you not like Batman? He doesn't have any superpowers. He has wealth. That is his superpower. Okay. I don't think incredible wealth. All right. There are some other people I won't name who are also super wealthy, who I do not think are superheroes. Batman pays his taxes though. Just saying. Is that the difference? Yeah. All right. Okay. Anthony Andrews did this in 1982 in a really good uh, made for TV movie that has Ian McKellar in it and Jane Jane Seymour Seymour. as his wife. Yeah. The Scarlet Pimpernel. There's been a lot of different versions of it. So we've got, uh, a, a cast here. We've got the the Richie folks who own the manor where they're filming. Okay, before we get into that, really quick, I have a tiny little thing about Ben's gadgets. Now? Yeah, because it's right at the very beginning. Okay. Okay. So Ben has a, a brand new phone. Is it a BlackBerry? No, it is a Nikia E61 64 megabit 3G phone. That phone would have been crazy top of the line at that point in time. The fancy part is it, of it is that he has a little mount on his dashboard so he can look at it while he drives. He, and he has a Bluetooth headset. So He, he can, is way ahead of his time. So here. he can put George Ince's picture up on it and yep. look at him while he's driving around. Yep. I'm after you, George. So, yes, we have kind of two sets of... We have the the film crew story, Mm -hmm. which is at Midsummer Magna at the Manor, which is owned by, uh, what is their last name? Charteris. Yes. Or Charterie. Charteries. And that is Terrence and Diane. Mm -hmm. And they, because they know the director of the movie, because he got their daughter pregnant. Nick Cheney. (laughs) They're letting him use... The, the set for free. Right, because Terrence and Diane are desperately trying to turn the manor into a business, and they think by allowing them to film there, that will help them. Yeah, they're going to kind of make it into a... An attraction. A uh, French Revolution theme park-ish thing. Because, you know, a British manor house, that's what the first thing you think of is French Revolution, right? Yes. Yeah, of course. And then the, you have the actor set... Which includes Gwen and Neville. Mm -hmm. Now, Gwen is friends with the daughter. Leonie Charteris. Yes. Whose son, Josh, is the director's son. Nick Cheney's son. All of this. All of this. Complete red herrings. Yep. Means nothing at all. Nope. Nope. Then you got Jack Braxton, who's the producer, who's also having an affair with Diane Charteris, Chartery, who you're not supposed to like. But he's fine. Braxton? Yeah. I don't mind Braxton at all. No. He's not doing anything wrong. No, and he talks like he he doesn't badmouth anybody. And he's like, when asked about the affair, he was like, yeah, I was sleeping with her. That were each other's alibis. I mean, Diane and Terrence are pretty open about the fact that they're their marriage is done. I mean, he goes to the local pub with another woman in full sight of everybody. He's not trying to hide it. Jack Braxton doesn't say it's another, that he's married to somebody else or anything. No, no. So, I mean, I, Jack is, he's, he's a a businessman. He's to the point and he's not super sad when Nick dies. 
But why should he fake being sad about somebody he didn't particularly well, like? And then he takes over as director. And he's not bad. No, he's doing just fine. He's not bad as the director. No. So he's all right. So, so I have to tell you a little tiny aside here. So I start the episode and the first thing, I, one of the first things in my notes is I list the dead bodies. Mm-hmm. I go to the, the wiki uh, that has the dead bodies on it and I copy the dead bodies into my notes and how they died. And I'm like, wait a minute. How is Gwen in this list when Gwen is the killer? And I'm like, well, maybe Gwen is not the killer. So then I'm like, okay, I got to find out. If I don't know who the killer is, I fast forward to the end of the episode and watch it, right? So I fast forward to three quarters of the way through the episode where Neville looks as guilty as sin. I'm like, okay, well, then it obviously is Neville who's the killer. And then I'm like, well... That doesn't seem right that it's Neville who's the killer. And then I fast forward a bit more and I see Neville in the guillotine. I'm like, okay, Dev Neville is definitely not the killer. Oh, it's that guy who's the killer. Okay. It's Raymond. <laughs> I was like, who is the killer in this episode? Raymond Clendillon, played by Desmond Barrett. You probably remember him as Jonathan Eckersley Hyde from the murder on St. Mally's Day episode. Yes, he doesn't have his manservant and his evil spoon. In no, this <laughs> his, spoon, his spoon thug. Yes, um, the spoon mace. Raymond Clendillon, again, I kind of was, I, I when I first saw this, I was disappointed that he was the killer because I like him too. Yes. I really like him. Does he have? He's a killer. Is that a wig or is that his real hair? When? When he's not wearing his costume, yeah. for the, that's his hair. Ooh, I thought he had less hair than that in the other episode. It was combed okay. down to his head. Okay. It's a little bit looser and freer in this because he's an actor. So then we have this other red herring about George Ince, who is the Inciest Ince of Inceville. <laughs> and he's Jed, a criminal. And Jed Norris. Yeah, who's a small-time criminal. Both of them are recently released from prison. Jed has been hired as a security guard at the manor and at the film set. And if George is is, uh, creeping around, then Tom and Jones know something's up. As far as we know, Jed is now on the straight and narrow. Except he's talking to George. But George could have shown up and said, I'm doing this gig. Yeah, yeah. And he should have turned him in. Yeah. And he does later flip sides and does what he should. So he's not a bad guy either. But none of this is really important. None None of of this is key to the plot. (laughs) None of it. (laughs) And that's all right. We we like red herrings or we wouldn't like Midsummer. I I had to laugh. So the the Charteries are... They're um, revamping this manor to turn it into like a historical site. And a lot of it, they're just blatantly making up, right? They're trying to associate it with Baroness Ortsy and saying that she came there and that's where she got the inspiration. Everybody knows it's not true. It's all sorts of lies. It's all sorts of lies. And so they're trying to turn it into a manor house that people would come to as tourists to see and associating it with the Scarlet Pimpernel. Yeah. And so they've got all these big um, billboards for directions around the manor. Yeah. Uh, for all these attractions that they intend to have, it including is. the Bastille Burger Bar, yep. the Marie Antoinette Tea Room, the Guillotine Gift Shop. Robespierre Reading Room and Le Revolution Fashion Accessories. Yep. It's fantastic that sign. That sign <laughs> like, alone. Really? They had a they had a a good time with that sign. They did. They did. The other thing they had a good time with is when we're introduced to Neville and Gwen, is there's a bunch of pictures between behind Neville. Yeah, because they're in their front room, and it's clear both of them did have successful acting careers when they were younger, but they haven't acted in 15, 16 years, right? Okay, Okay. so we'll get the one thing out of the way right away. Why the hell is Gwen doing tarot cards at this point in time? I have no idea. It doesn't relate to the rest of the plot. It's just... Oh. It makes her look mysterious and spooky. Yeah, and she doesn't do tarot cards right, and I'm just like... It's so she can flip over the death card. Dun, yep. dun, dun. Dun. That's the only reason tarot cards ever appear in anything. Yeah. <laughs> but behind Neville on oh, the wall. Behind Neville. There are playbills and things like that from, yep. from plays and other things. But there are photographs there. That are weird. They because are in jokes among the Midsummer Murders crew. They've got to be. They have to be. Because we have pictures of 
other actors and Gwen, but they're in costume. Other, in, they're characters from other episodes who are not actors. Yes. And Gwen. Yes. So like for, Mr. Toad. So for instance, Freddy, Josh Acklin from uh, Vixen's Run. Uh, we have Gwen and the doctor from Dead Letters, That's Simon Callow. Simon Callow with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth because he's got one in the whole episode. Yeah. <laughs> Like, they were not part of these pictures. These are Photoshop jobs. Oh, absolutely. We have Gwen's headshot as a younger woman. Mm -hmm. And then Gwen uh, with the peace, priest from Badger's Drift. Richard Breyer's in costume as the priest from Badger's Drift. Like, would you have that picture on your wall after what he did? No. No, I would not. I wouldn't. Yeah, so apparently Gwen is knows all the who's who of all of Midsummer. And yes. has her photo taken with them for no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, maybe they're trying to make some kind of meta reference. I don't. Uh, and uh, saying that Gwen is actually a fan of Midsummer Murders and was on the sets for all those other episodes. I think they're probably saying, hey, we made that funny sign about the revolution. Why don't we put it in some funny pictures? Yeah, yeah. So the problem with the movie is the crowds are not big enough. They need more hags and crones. More hags and crones. Who do they turn to? Joyce. Because this this opening is almost exactly the same as the opening of the House That Satan Built episode. Yeah, the House of for, Satan. There's half the people in that episode <laughs> than there is now. <laughs> Midsummer definitely got a little bit more money now. But they like rented all the same costumes and they just put red, white, and blue pins on everybody. Yeah. And <laughs> made them say, Viva the Revolution! Yeah. Joyce and Gwen, who volunteer at the Cedars. The Cedars, oh! We know about the Cedars. We know cedars. All about the Cedars. Yep. Again, they also run a, a charity shop for the Cedars where Leonie works. Yes. And they go to the old folks' home and round up all the hags and crones they can find, some who are over 80 years old. Yeah, over 80? And bring them to set to put them in rags. At eight in the morning? No, eight is too early. I thought old people got up early in the morning. They do. They're, they're ready for do. lunch by nine. I know. Jeez. And it's no wonder that the later scenes, the crowd is like, hey. Yeah. They're all old people who've been up too long. Yeah, I know. It's five or <laughs> four o'clock. It's dinner time. But it gets Joyce on set. And they use Danny's dial bus. Yeah. <laughs> so Danny Twyman is played by Kieran Boo. Who is the nicest, most real person who is... Totally boring in this episode. Yeah, he's angry, but for a good reason. So Cheney has come into town. He's the father of Leonie's baby. Don't you mean Daryl Hall? <laughs> You're just making a Hall and Oates reference because he wears that scarf. Like Daryl Hall. But Danny and Leonie. I can't go for that. <laughs> Man eater. Danny and Leonie are definitely a good couple. They're raising the baby together. Yep. They've got no room for he Nick. He followed her back and is helping her. Yeah. He has a job. They have a million dollar house. Oh, don't even get me started. <laughs> Yeah, he's a good guy. If he roughs up Nick, it's for good reason. Because apparently Nick wants to be involved in the baby's life, though we see no evidence of that no. at all. He helps old ladies out of the truck. He does. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Uh, Boring, but good. So I have to, can, can I do a little side story here? Okay. Okay. So Kieran Boo, who plays Danny Twyman, was also in Alien versus Predator. Oh, God. <laughs> And you know why I'm saying that. <laughs> so Alien vs. Predator 2 came yes. out in 2007, and our children were six years old. Alien vs. Predator, you and I saw at the theater. Yes. Yes. So Mark and I take, have we told this story before? No, I we, don't think we so. We took the whole posse. So six of us, Mark and I and four six-year-olds, we go to the movie theater to see some kids movie. And the way we always manage this gaggle of kids that we had was we would get settled in in seats and then one of us would go out and get the concessions and bring them back. So I did that this time. We were running a little bit late. Yes. And so as we got seated, the lights were basically going down for the previews. Yep. So I get the kids all settled. Everybody's looking at us in the theater, which 
Everybody always looked at us wherever we went. We, we were a we, crowd when we moved We were anywhere. a walking advertisement for birth control. When you and I show and four up, little kids. It's a party. Yeah. So I'm used to people scowling at us like, why do you have so many kids? Whatever. Anyway, so we're all settled in and Mark comes back and he's like, Sarah, Sarah. And I'm like, we're in the wrong theater. I'm like, what? Because this is like an eight plex cinema, right? This is Alien versus Predator 2, <laughs> which is a rated R movie. So no wonder everybody was scowling at us. They're like, what are you doing bringing six-year-olds to Aliens versus Predator 2? <laughs> so we hustle the kids out of the theater and into the right one. And oh, geez. It would have been Scarred a different day if we had just stayed there. Yep. <laughs> Anywho, okay, Terrence file, fires Neville. Neville is supposed to be some kind of historian helping write some documentation for the house, but he, he's being asked to write things that aren't true. Terrence is, he's a jerk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's got one of those mustaches that is clearly dyed. Yeah. Like an older guy who's trying to color his hair so he's not gray, and so it just looks like, it's just like a monotone brown mustache. He's trying to make a buck. But he crosses the line and his wife is clearly having an affair. So I don't have a problem with him and Gemma Page, who we'll get to. Yeah, no, I don't have a problem with any of that. But he's just he's just kind of skeezy. Yeah. Right. So he fires Neville. So Neville and Gwen decide to become background uh, artists. Yes. Extras. Background artists. Yes. Uh, in, in the movie. Are they aristocrats or are they? She's an aristocrat. No, they are. They're both aristocrats. Yes. Because she, she's going to go on the guillotine and he's got a powdered wig. Yes. Right. Then their buddy Raymond shows up. Yes. Who they used to be in lots of things together. Raymond is flamboyant and over the top and basically bullies Nick into letting him have a part. But he's going to be a peasant. And I'm like, okay. That would not happen in movie sets. Yeah, you just show up. Wait, no, well, no. Not Never mind that. that there's like. Not that. When when you have a movie and somebody says they want to be in it and they're willing to be an extra, you're like, okay, because movies, especially small productions, always need more people. What I have a problem with, well, a couple of things. What I have a problem with is the, the idea is that the little boy has a hoop and he runs out and then this rider comes up. Uh-huh. Right? And then Raymond pulls Raymond up in his car. Pulls up in his car. That road would have been a closed. Yeah, absolutely. Like he couldn't have got on that set. But it wouldn't be any fun if he pulled I up know. out in the parking lot. I know. <laughs> I was thinking more like, well, there's like a union of background artists, and you would have to have like a card and be signed in and have paperwork turned in. But and, he would be part of the union already. Yeah, but still. They're, they're, they they would have a whole agency who was just in charge of extras, who was organizing all of that. And we find out about Ted. Ted is the brother who died. Oh, that Ted. That okay. Ted. I thought you were talking about Jed. No, poor Ted. <laughs> now I remember. Ted's Neville's brother. Yeah. He died 15 years ago. Yeah. Of alcoholism. Yep. And he and Raymond used to drink together, but Raymond has quit drinking, and that's why Chaney lets him back on set. So now we learn that Neville and Gwen are not partners. No. Not that it's implied at this point, but we know they live together. Right. But she, he's her brother-in-law. Yes. And so she lets him stay with her. The budget is as tight as a tourniquet. But they have a piggy. Did you see the piggy? Oh my gosh, how could you miss the piggy? It's huge. The piggy is huge. Sisyphus. Sisyphus. I'm going to talk about Sisyphus. Because I'm fancy. Well, the bartender, Freddie Greenaway, who everybody knows, says, is that a medical complaint? Yep. <laughs> everybody knows Freddie Greenaway in his bar with Aristos and Peasants rooms. Yeah, what's up with that? I don't know. I I'm think it's a holdover or something. Yeah, some kind of joke, maybe. I don't know. I looked up Braxton's license plate because he's got this personalized license plate that says BRX space 700N. Yeah. And remember, we were watching, we watched an episode of Dave Gorman's Modern Life is Goodish. Yep. And he, he was talking about, about personalized plates. UK. See, yep. in the US, if you want a personalized license plate, you just go to the same place where you get a regular license plate. And if it's available, you can have it. And it's not on, and a, it's the on same, a list of like FCK. Right. FF. Right. If it's allowed. Yeah. Right. And it's the same price 
but with a small fee yeah. for a personalized plate. And the fee is exactly the same for everybody. For everybody, for every plate, no matter yeah. what it is. Yep. But in the UK, personalized license plates are kind of sold by auction. It's like an economy. Yeah. So I wanted to know, because Dave Gorman made all those jokes about what would be more expensive, this yep. personalized or that. So I looked his, I looked this one up yep. and it's actually not possible because their license plates are either two, two characters of space and three three characters a space and three or four characters a space and three and Braxton's is three and a space and four. Uh, so it can't be. Yeah. And you can't get BRX either. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a five, five, five phone number. Yeah. They're just having fun. It's a fake one. Yeah. It can't, it can't be real. So now you know that. Cause I know you were all burning to know how much would it cost for me to get Jack Braxton's license plate. In case you're wondering, we're 25 minutes into the episode. Not our episode. 25 minutes into the episode of Midsummer. Of Midsummer. And no one's died yet. And no one has died yet. Well, they're gonna. Yep. Because Jed is the worst security guy ever. Yeah. He just kind of wanders around and lets people get guillotined. It's guillotined. <laughs> guillotined. That is the hardest word to spell. It is. It's like, a, it's a French word, of course. And I. Just basically put word salad in and then used <laughs> autocorrect to fix it. G, some vowels, some L's, some T's. Yep. Let's see what happens. So this guillotine is a, it's supposed to be a prop guillotine, right? Which would mean it could never work. No, they would have, in reality, they would have two. Okay. They would have the one that is used in filming. Yes. And they would have the prop, the prop one that had a blade that actually went down enough to go past the hole where the neck would be. That would go nowhere near any oh, actor. Oh, no, no, no actor would ever go anywhere near it. Never. It would be used only to um, insert scenes. And because I looked all this up in a prop guillotine that's, that can actually cut, the blade is only allowed to, to um, be raised no more than six inches above where the human's head would go. Ah, uh, okay. So they can only show it like in that last like split second when the blade is just about to come down low enough to cut somebody's head off. Yeah. That's as much movement as it can yeah. actually have. Yeah. You can rent a prop guillotine for a few hundred dollars a day. Also. So if you ever want, you know, yeah, you can get one. Also, if someone was actually killed by a prop on set, that prop will be taken to the cop shop. Oh my gosh. Not only would it be taken away, everything would stop. Yes. Everything would Immediately. stop. Immediately. I need to keep an eye on you. That makes no sense at all, Barnaby. <laughs> Not only would it stop, but there would be so many insurance people around. Oh my gosh, yes. Just, just that alone would shut it down. Well, the director would have been insured. So if you're a director in a movie, you're insured as well. Yeah. Because the idea is if you're like... If something happens to you and you can't, you're you Steven can't Spielberg go on with the movie. You can't finish a movie because it's going to cost a ton of money. Yeah. to replace you. You're you're definitely insured. So Nick gets killed, and George. Don't and you his, mean grumpy pants? And his blue suit crew have to come and gather the evidence. So George makes a joke. He does. Five to six hours, head separated from body. Cause of death, head separated from body. Yes. And Jones is like, oh, he's making jokes. I can be jokey. No, Grumpy Pants is like, stop making jokes. <laughs> what does what joke does Jones make? I, oh, I guess we don't have to go far to look for to find the murder weapon. Yeah. So then one of George's lackeys puts the head in an evidence bag and carries it off. <laughs> <laughs> you would not do that. No. You would put really that entire thing would be picked up. Put in a truck and moved. In another mini episode of why the hell did Sarah Google that? Yes. I wondered, what do they do with a head that's separated from the body? Okay. Would it go in an evidence bag? Okay. Because they do put evidence bags over your hands to no. preserve evidence, yeah. things like that, over on a corpse's hands. Yes. So I wondered. Okay. In the United States, at least. Yes. Even if all they had was the head. Yes. It goes in a body bag. Goes Period. In, yeah, any body part goes in a body bag. It goes in a body bag. 
So you might have a full length body bag with just a head in it, but it's not going in an evidence bag. <laughs> so then you don't want to go down the road that I had to go down to find that information. No, I don't. They choose the worst room to do interviews. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's be fair. Every room in this place is kind of the worst room to do it in. Yeah. Either we're at the 20 foot dining table that we sit at opposite ends of because we're losers. Yeah, okay. Or we're in a room full of dead things. So I'm like, the, to show that the marriage is dead, the Chartereses sit at the very opposite ends of easily a 30 foot table, 40 foot table. It seats at least 10 people to a side. Why would you ever eat like that? And the thing is, this is all a bastardization of a trope that began, in film at least, in Citizen Kane. And Citizen Kane, of course, because it's a masterpiece, does it majestically <laughs> how the, the marriage is dissolving by showing how they change how they sit when they eat. But this is just... It's hacky. I, but it's also a little reference to maybe Lawrence... Um, uh, is is not big enough for the britches that he wishes he had and wants to be a lord of the manor and so insists on, you know, like uh, Lady Tamara or whatever her name is yeah. in, in a Vixen's Run. Like, we're going to do this right. If we were actually yeah, aristocrats, we would sit at opposite ends. It is easily twice the size of Freddie's table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Freddie had money. Yeah. So the room they're in... Is full of heads, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> including a warthog, a cheetah, a lion, and a bear. At one point on the side table, there are a pair of cheetah heads. Yeah. Like on opposite ends like of, they a, have of extra a cheetah sideboard. Heads. Yeah. Because, you know, you can never have too many cheetah heads. No. And I, I really like, um, so Terrence is saying, well, you know, this place is completely full of priceless things, irreplaceable things. And Jones is like looking at this cabinet, like he's opening it and he's closing okay, it. He's, he gets, he's tiptoeing and he looking get, up over it. He gets a phone call. He says, his, well, first of all, he gets a phone call that causes him to body check the cabinet. Yes. <laughs> this is, the blocking here is a bit clumsy. Yes. He stumbles into a cabinet trying to get to the door. And then he says, oh, it was nobody. It was a wrong number. And the thing that bothered me the most, the thing that bothered me the most about this episode is we see the fancy Nokia at the beginning of the episode. Jones doesn't have that phone the rest of the episode. He has a little flip phone the rest of the episode. I didn't notice that. I'm like, that's not the same phone. Well, Jones's granddad was a master cabinet maker, master, so he knows the difference between master cabinet maker between junk and and good antiques. Yep, and he knows that that piece is a piece of junk. I'm going to take over as director. Okay, so these are the next two headings in my notes. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. I run a charity shop, and I'm an unemployed historian. Welcome to our million dollar home. <laughs> Maybe Ted had big insurance or something. My notes then follow. Gwen is sad. Neville is not. Because Gwen is sad because her and uh, Cheney had an affair. Right. And they had a baby that she aborted. Right. Okay. My next note. I run a cab company and I'm an unemployed single parent, but my parents are rich. Welcome to our million dollar cottage. Well, they do say that Terrence lets Leonie have the cottage for free. Yes, because they spend all their money on posters. Well, they were both drama students. Yes. So maybe they were in all those productions uh, at the, the Crucible. The Crucible. So the poster on the wall that caught my attention first is The Web We Wove, mm -hmm. which I'm like, that's not a real play. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it anywhere. And then at the bottom, it says, clearly says Crucible. I'm like, okay, The Crucible is about witches in America? Yeah. Why is that on the wall? <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm like, oh, okay. There's Le Perichol in the background, mm -hmm. uh, which is an opera bouffe in three acts by Jacques Offenbach. Wow, you really went deep down that rabbit hole. Yeah. 
Uh, Midsummer Dream is in the back and The Tempest is in the back. So Lanny like, and Danny were both drama students. That's how she met Nick Cheney. He came to give a guest lecture. As a director, he came to give a guest lecture. Got her drunk, had sex with her, maybe kind of against her will. Yep. Hence, she has Josh the baby. Yes. And so it makes sense that their house would be decorated in this way, though they both seem to be trying to distance themselves from that part of their lives as much as possible. So I don't know why they would want to surround themselves with it. But anyway, they're not important anyhow. So the Crucible Theater, <laughs> the important thing here is a theater in the city center of Sheffield. Okay. It opened in 1971, and it is well known for theatrical performances. I guess it must be a theater in the round. Call it the Crucible. That kind of makes sense. Uh Uh-huh. But also, it is the home of the World Snooker Championship since 1975. So Snooker. Shakespeare on Saturday and Snooker on Sunday, huh? Yep. Yep. It's quite the place, then. If you've seen professional snooker on TV, it was probably at the Crucible. Nice. When when Jones and Barnaby interview Raymond after Nick is murdered. One thing before that. One more thing about Nick and the baby. This uh, this episode's only 13 years old, mm-hmm. but I don't think anybody's ever going to say it wasn't rape, but he took advantage of me. It may not have been rape. Yeah. That that just wouldn't wouldn't fly. Now. No. No, I agree with you. Okay. So they interview Raymond. I love Raymond in this scene. He's like, oh, I thought about killing Nick I to get his a, room. I wanted a bigger room. <laughs> it's My room is that bad. It's yes. so bad. I would kill to have a better room. <laughs> He's so fun. He is fun. He's so fun. We looked him up in the database. That's the, a sly IMDB reference. The uh, database. The database. So Internet Movie Database. If you don't use Internet data, Movie Database... What the hell are you listening to this podcast for? IMDb, yeah. <laughs> How old do you think IMDb is? Uh, 10 years? It is almost 30 years old. Wow! The 17th of October this year, it will be 30 years old. It's changed since it started it, then. I <laughs> I remember almost uh, like the first time I went there would have been 94. It would have been all text. All text. And I was like, this website has everything. (laughs) (laughs) Now, this is before it had pictures. Right, right. right. Um, But I know as a kid, I would have been on that site all of the time. Oh, my gosh. Because I was constantly going, isn't that guy the guy who's in the thing? thing Have I seen him before? Yeah. Yeah. Is he going to be in some murder mystery show that I have a podcast about in 25 years? What's a podcast? Well, this movie, the Scarlet Pimpernel movie, only has two scenes. Yes. It has the guillotine scene, guillotine yes. scene, and the drawing room scene. S with Gemma Page. Gemma? Gemma. Gemma. Uh, so she plays Lady Blakeney. Mm-hmm. And she is, she's semi, like she's done a couple of things. But there is this extremely weird scene with her and Neville. And Barnaby in the background, where Barnaby sets it up to reveal Neville's character, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. Nowhere in the history of humanity that has any sort of empathy would they ever put Gwen in the guillotine after somebody actually died. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Let's just talk about the guillotine. Never mind. It was a past lover. Let's just talk about the guillotine. Okay. It would have human blood on it. Real human blood. It's not like the Sockos would come and clean up every molecule. They That's wouldn't. what Sockos don't do that. They don't That's do Mrs. that. That's Mrs. and Mr. Murder. Right. <laughs> right. They, a crime scene cleanup unit would come in and do it. Yeah. But they wouldn't because, well, what's fake and what's real blood on this thing? We don't know. Yeah. So the fact that they keep the guillotine, we're just going to have to suspend disbelief <laughs> there. Okay. But you know who doesn't believe it? That anonymous PC that they assigned to guard it. Oh my God! Does who he just stand? <laughs> he does not care. Mr. Adam's apple. He just stands there with his chin up, looking at it, swallowing. He's Gunk. like, "I'm a dude who has an Adam's apple." Mom, mom, I got a part. Mom, <gasps> it's mom. on Midsummer Murders. Yeah. Oh my gosh! What role are you playing? 
I'm a PC who just stands around and stares yep. and gets in the way. Doesn't even get a name. Nope. Yeah. I like Raymond, but he slaps Gwen's butt. Another thing that I'm like, no, that's not going to go. Yeah, I don't know. They've been friends for like 20, 30 years. He's gay. She's single. You know, I don't think. It, In the privacy of her own home. Absolutely. Actors are different. But Mark. that's a public place. <laughs> that's a problem. He knows how to cheer her up. And early you think it's genuine, like they're friends and he genuinely is there and is willing to cheer her up because she's had a sad life. The only time that she thought she was actually going to have a baby and successfully carry the baby, she had to get rid of the baby because it was Nick's. Yep. And she knew her husband would be upset. The Four Musketeers. No, that's the wrong book. Mm. That's the other book. Yes. <laughs> uh, they have a picture of them in a movie, and it is a young version of each of them. It's not a bad Photoshop. It's not a bad Photoshop. It's supposedly from a movie called The Cross and the Sword. Uh, there is no movie called The Cross and the Sword. I also did a IMDb cross-reference with all those people to see if they had been in a movie when they were younger. No. None of them. I think if it was a picture from a play they were all in and not a Photoshop, I would have been, I, I think I would be okay with that. But the poor guy who plays Ted, that's the only thing he has to do with it is that one photo. That one photo. Poor Ted. But let's see. So Gwen and Terrence were both in Dark Autumn. Yeah. I think that's the only two who are in other episodes of Midsummer. And in this one, who were actually in one together. Yeah, so... Are Terrence and... Gwen, Gwen, Neville, Raymond, Jack, and Terrence all were in other episodes earlier before episodes. this. Yes, earlier episodes. Yep. This is all their last episodes of Midsummer. Yes. So Cheney was drugged. Yes. Before his head was cut off. Yeah. He was given Oromorph. Yes. Which is real. Is it a real cancer it, drug? Uh, it is a, a, a liquid... Oral morphine that you take by the spoonful, and it's largely used for people who are near death and in incredible pain. So that would make sense. It's It makes sense that Raymond would have it. And somebody who wasn't in incredible pain would get knocked out by it. Especially if you put it in your flask with some whiskey. Yes. Mixing it together would be very potent. Yes. So Cheney's on the table in the morgue, and he's got some hairy ass toes. He does. He's got super hairy toes. Got some hair. Whoever's playing the body in that scene, because we don't see anything else. No. It's not like they can pan up to his head. His head's in a baggie somewhere. Baggie. <laughs> oh. Head in a baggie may be the episode title. Yes. Yes. And then we know that Terrence and Ince are in on an insurance scheme and that they're going to rope Jed into it. And right? they go, and they, the Red Herring Brigade. Goes and talks to Jed and convinces him to join the, the good side, the light side. Yes. And then Neville professes his love for Gwen. She's never going to return it. And Raymond goes off in his car and goes off the road. Well, no. Before that, he confronts Neville, too. With the note that we know nothing about at that point. No idea how that note got there and how he got it. We don't even know what it says then. We don't know what it says then. And, oh, that note is annoying as crap. Well, did Plus you? Plus Neville would have written a letter. <laughs> you don't think he would cut out newspaper letters no, and glue them? not Neville. And how long has Raymond been holding on to it? 15 years. So the conceit here. Okay, I buy the inciting incident mm. that now Raymond is sick and so he's decided to kill these people. Mm -hmm. I'll buy that. Okay. okay. Death changes people and he might turn into a psychotic murderer because of it. Yeah. Okay. What I don't buy is Neville waiting that long for Gwen. Where else does he have to go? The entire world? Maybe he's just world? happy just to... Just to live with her. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's close enough. At some point, you got to go, I don't think this is going to happen. And that would probably happen in the first year, not the 15th year. I think it would happen the first time she said, I don't feel that way about you. Yeah. Which would have been pretty early. Yeah. 
I looked around Raymond's car. Okay. What in Raymond's car? So Raymond has one of his spells. At first I was like, is he acting like he's been poisoned? Oh no, he's having one of his spells. Right. Okay. He has high blood pressure. Well, he has cancer. He has cancer. In his car is a bunch of junk. Yes. <laughs> Paperwork, maps, I was like, receipts, oh my random God. stuff. They're so messy. It's like that girl's bed. I know. It makes you crazy. But in the far door pocket, when Tom gets in the car to turn it off, yep. is a magazine Ooh. called The Chap. Oh, what is The Chap? Not what I thought it was. Oh. I thought, well, you know, Raymond is is a gay guy and this is his car. So maybe it's, you know... A male magazine. Male. No. The Chap is quite an interesting magazine, okay. actually. Okay, what is it? Um, everything you need to know is kind of wrapped up in what they call their manifesto. Okay. Okay? <clears throat> They've got the, ten rules. This is the Chap manifesto. This is the Chap manifesto. Okay. Number one, thou shalt always wear tweed. Oh. Okay. Number two, thou shalt never smoke. Number three, thou shalt always be courteous to ladies. Okay. Thou shalt never, ever wear pantaloons de nims. Okay. I don't know what pantaloons de nims is. I didn't okay. look them up. But, oh, I know. Jeans. Ah, uh, You yes. can never wear jeans. Never wear jeans. Thou shalt always doff one's hat. Doff. Thou shalt never fasten the lowest button on thy waistcoat. Sometimes never. Sometimes. Always never. Always never. Yeah. Thou shalt always speak properly. It's quite simply, really. Just don't say, yo, what's up? Say, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a magazine that's still going oh, on? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Thou shalt never wear plimsolls when not doing sport. Okay. Nor even when doing sport, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, except <laughs> cricket. <laughs> What about polo? I don't think you... Uh, depends what kind of polo it is, I guess. Thou shalt always worship at thy trouser press. At the end of each day, your trousers should be placed in one of Mr. Corby's magical contraptions. And by the next morning, your creases will be so sharp that they will start a riot on the high street. There we go. And number 10, my favorite. Okay. Thou shalt always cultivate interesting facial hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a magazine for you. It is a magazine Except for you me. like jeans and sneakers. I don't wear jeans very much, but I don't wear pants. You don't wear much. tweed. No, I don't wear tweed. You wear, you wear shorts. You wear pants. I don't want people to think you're just sitting around in your underwear. You're not like that. No. That and if you're rude. British, saying you don't wear pants means you don't wear underwear either. <laughs> I wear short pants. <laughs> Over your pants. Yes. <laughs> So now Neville's going to run away. Why is Neville running away? Because he's just had enough. After 15 years, he finally snapped. I think he's afraid. I think he's afraid of Raymond, which he has good reason to be. Yeah. He. And if he if he is afraid of Raymond, he also fears for Gwen at Raymond's hand, which he should turns out again. Um, yeah. But Gwen won't go with him. No. So for, for the first time, he says, well, then I'm getting out of here on my own. Yeah. Because I'm not going to get killed. Because he grows a backbone for once. Yes. The manor has got to be an expensive place to maintain. It must be really pricey to heat because not one person closes the door. She just runs out of the house. It doesn't close the door. Everybody does. Oh, Barnaby walks out, leaves the door open. Wide Jones open. leaves the door. The only person who closes it is Terrence. He locks it and gets in his car. I want to know also where is the rest of the staff? Yeah, who runs that house? Yeah, because it's not them. It's it. Jed is the only person we see working for them. Yes, and he opens the door and lets the baddies in. <laughs> but Jones is on the case. <laughs> I just, I just feel bad for George. When they find Gwen on the guillotine. Yeah, they don't even show Gwen's body. No. But At he, first, I thought Gwen in the carriage was that mannequin. I I'm know. Like, Raymond's like <laughs> taken off with the body in the yeah. carriage. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's a mannequin. I just, I feel bad for him. Of course, they stop Ince from ransacking the house, which makes Terrence upset. And then they know he's in on it. They always yeah. knew he was in on it. Yeah. And now Raymond has drugged Neville. Why Neville would even talk to Raymond, I don't know. Well, we, we missed Neville's speech. 
when they decide to close down the production, Neville gives the speech. Not Neville. Uh, Raymond gives the speech. Well, it's it's Gwen's eulogy. Really, it is. Who is that woman in the background? I don't know. What woman? She's in the catering truck, and she's doing catering things. Mm. She's just working in the background. Catering person doing catering things. Yep. Leather cat, leather bikini. Wouldn't a leather bikini be really uncomfortable? And super like, cold. Understandable. Bikinis themselves have to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. But a leather bikini? Really? It's got to be incredibly uncomfortable. And really, really cold. Yeah. When everybody's wearing coats over their costumes. So Raymond's drugged Neville. He's got him in the guillotine. Yep. But Tom has changed the lock. Well, okay. Jones is sneaking in the background. <laughs> Ineffectively. Sneaky Jones is sneaking. But he's literary. Uh, yes. And Tom uses the reverse psychology. Ineffectively. Ineffective. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Jones That's is like. the wrong book. Jones is like, that's a tale of two cities. Uh, <laughs> you're so dumb. Dumb. But of course, Barnaby hasn't told Jones that he swapped the lock on the guillotine. Which they never would have done. So. Jones thinks that it could really work. And he says he was sweating cobs. Do you know what that's a reference to? No. So a cob is a cob horse. It's a workhorse. Oh, okay. And they sweat. So okay. if you're sweating cobs, you're sweating like a, a workhorse. And then he gives his best performance for last. And the guillotine goes down, which we found out from the magazine was not in the script. No. They just did it. Yeah. It was on purpose. Yeah. It wasn't an accident or anything, but it, it wasn't written in the script. Nope. It's not... I'm going to say this is not a good episode. No. It's not an unfun episode. No. But, eh. I I remember liking Gwen a lot more. I don't know why I didn't like her this much this time. It's got so many red herrings that if you ignore all of those and just focus on the actual plot, the true plot, it's, is Raymond was in love with Ted, Ted died, and he blames Neville and Gwen and Nick. Which I Even do Even though believe. he was the one who drank with Ted. Yep. And, and pr- was probably more at fault than any of them. And he does this because he's dying. All of that I buy. But the rest of that, that's two minutes. Yeah. The rest of it is just red herrings. Yeah. Or scarlet herrings. Oh, you're clever. Uh, but they're not that. even interesting red no, herrings. No, they're not. That's what's sad. Yeah. Okay, but you know what is interesting? What? Two horrible movies that I don't think you have seen. Okay, lay it on me. Are you ready? Somebody told me this week this was their favorite part of the episode. <laughs> I'm going to get two out of two here. Okay. I know it. You think I you are. I know it. Black Moon Rising. You thought that one was. I know. I really did think I had one there. I should have known better. Okay. So these both of these movies have Nikki Henson in them. Okay. So he Nikki, plays Terrence Shorteris. He's in so many things. He is. But in the seventies, he was in some bad movies. He, he was indeed. Okay. This is a nineteen seventy four movie. Okay. Here's the plot. Okay. In order to revive his long hibernating bride, Vampira, Count Dracula takes blood samples from several beautiful models. But during the transfusion, Vampira's race turns from white to black. Okay. It's a mashup of a bad Dracula movie and kind of a black exploitation movie. Yeah, so this is not Blackula and not Scream Blackula Scream. No. Okay. <laughs> I have seen this movie. I <laughs> know I have. David Niven plays Dracula. David Niven. Oh. I'm going to get a point. Yeah, I don't know. Old Dracula. It's called Old Dracula. That's the stupidest name I ever. Know. <laughs> it should be called like Vampira or something. something. I don't know. It's called Old Dracula. Wow. One point for me. One point Huzzah. for you. I've seen that movie, but I didn't remember it. The second movie, also starring Nikki Henson, is from 1973. <laughs> and... The tagline is the grooviest zombie biker movie of them all. Do you want the plot? Yeah. An amiable psychopath and leader of a violent teen gang enjoys riding his motorcycle and loves his mother who enjoys holding seances. He commits suicide and succeeds in returning as the undead continuing to terrorize the locals. 
<laughs> In the movie, they bury him on his motorcycle. <laughs> oh gosh. I need to see this movie. I've never seen this it's movie. It's called The Death Wheelers. The Death Wheel. Wow. The alternative title was Psychomania. When it was released in uh, other places, it was called Psychomania. No, I never saw it. That's two for two, yes! baby. Yes! Yes! Yeah, I never the saw it. The grooviest zombie biker movie of them all. <laughs> I love that. Like, there are so many groovy zombie biker movies, but this know. one is the grooviest. <laughs> it's as near as I can tell from all the clips I watched is they look no different when they're undead. Nice. Like they're not green or any, you know, they don't look like zombies. They just look like, you know, bikers. Oh. Like kind of mod bikers too. Oh, okay. They have skull, they have uh, helmets, like the um, uh, the World War II helmets that just come down to your yeah. ears, you know, not a full helmet. Yeah. But the visors look like Skull eyes. I'll, I'll have to put <laughs> a poster of some pictures in the in the show notes for both of those. I win. I win. You do. Two points for me. The best corpse. <laughs> nice corpse. It has to be Nick. Yeah, it's got to be Nick. It's the only corpse we see, and we see it for the briefest of seconds. We do for get to feet. sort of see the head that they made sort of him. Of? It's recognizably him. Yeah. I mean, not if it could be anybody, but if it's like, oh, it's a character from this show who we've already seen who's now dead. Which one of it is? Which Plus one of them is it? Scarf on. No, he doesn't. <laughs> if he'd had his hollow oats scarf on, it might have protected him. He might have. That blade might not have been sharp enough to cut through that uh, scarf. I can't go for that. <laughs> You're such a loser sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we don't even get to see Gwen's. We get to see feet. Yeah, that's it. But that could, might not even be Gwen's feet. She's in a dirty nightgown. She's in the dirty nightgown half of the show. Yeah. All right, after the credits. Danny and Leone make out like bandits. Why? Because I think Diane will be now very happy mm-hmm. that Terrence is in jail. Mm-hmm. She gets all the money in the house and everything. Right? Well, and, and I, I think so. she likes being a grandma. I do too. I like Diane. I think she yeah. seems like a good person. So I think Danny, Leone, and Diane are happy. So are, are Diane and Jack going to stay together? I think so. Yeah, and he seems all right. Yeah. That, that, I have a note that Jack, he drives off, but he's got a friend in Midsummer Magna now. Yeah. Raymond's probably going to die of his cancer before he goes to trial. Yep. Ince goes to jail. Terrence goes to jail. Neville and Gwen? Okay. No, Gwen's dead. Sorry, Gwen's Neville. Dead. Neville is sad. Sadder they, than he was before. 15 years of his life gone. All his friends dead. Mm-hmm. He has no job. No. All he has is his million dollar home. <laughs> If Gwen leaves it to him. Did you notice they had horses? No, they don't have horses. There's horses right out in front of their house. But they're probably not theirs. Still. They could be somebody else's horses. Poor Neville. Neville gets the short end of the stick here. He can go and hang out with uh, Freddie Greenaway and ye old bell. Yes. Ye old bell. (laughs) And then Jed Norris, the ex-con, dodges a bullet, doesn't get caught up in Ince's Schemes. So I got a couple of questions about Jed. Okay. J- is Jed the worst security guard ever? He is. Okay. Second, why is he having dreams of the French Revolution? I don't know. I think we're supposed to think that he's not a hardened criminal, that he's actually kind of bothered by seeing somebody beheaded. Or is it another reason to show some more post revolutionary footage? <laughs> We got, all hate, this, we got all this footage of hags and crones in costume. What are we going to do with it? I know. Let's give Jed a bad dream. That'll I work. hate dream sequences, and I hate dream sequences that are there for absolutely no reason. <laughs> He's got a mag light, so that makes him a good security guard. He's got he, a big flashlight. He wanders. Did you notice Jones's coat? It's a really nice coat. That gray wool one yeah. that he wears over the red turtleneck? Yeah, yeah it's like, a nice jacket. Oh, that's a nice jacket. <laughs> That's a highlight right there. <laughs> that, li- that is an example of how this episode, because... Because your mind's wandering. As going, soon as hmm. you know who the killer is, you're like, this part doesn't matter. No. This part doesn't matter. This part doesn't matter. Did you like Raymond's coat? It's, it's oh, yes. plaid and it's, it's plaid. got the cape jobby yeah. on it. I didn't. I don't like cape jobbies. Only somebody like him could wear that Only. coat. Only. 
someone like him could wear it. He's yeah. outrageous. He's fun. And he's he's a big man, so he can wear a coat that has a cape. He's a buddy to with it. a spoon mace. <laughs> Who tromps across fields carrying a spoon? <laughs> yes, <laughs> me kill with spoon. Uh, the purpose of a, a recap podcast is not to talk about another episode. That's how boring this one is, <laughs> yeah. though. We're like, boy, I miss that thug with a spoon. This is not Traveler's episode bad. No. But close. Yeah. Ah, well, I got two points. You did indeed get two points. Woohoo! Next Week, we will end episode 10, uh, season, season 10. 10, with episode 8, which is Death in a Chocolate Box, which I constantly confuse with other episodes. Yeah. But this is another Barnaby relationship with a red haired person. Red haired person <laughs> episode. But this is uh, Corrupt Cops. Yeah. It's, it's kind of serious. The Friday Night Gang. Yeah. So. There's some sex in the cells. Yeah. Yeah. There's some dark stuff in and there. There's some shooting and oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. It's there, a serious episode. And there's train too. train. Choo-choo. I like trains. So I like it when they go on trains. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I like trains. All right. You'll see some, uh, you guys will see some uh, t-shirt design ideas soon. Yeah. We've got lots of good recommendations. Thank you. this week you'll see our post. Yeah. Check out the Acorn post. Yep. Just just to see the list of shows that we recommended. That might be kind of fun. Yep. And if you don't have Acorn and you're interested, why not use the discount code? I mean, again, we don't make any money off of it. Use it. Don't use it. We don't care. Um, But if you were going to sign up anyway, you may as well save some cash. Everybody can use uh, it right now. That'd be a fun thing to do. Yeah. Why why not? not? Yeah. Um, And it's not like, like, it's not like, it's like, like a mattress company or something. You just said like, like nine times. And then you made me say it. It's not like a mattress company that has nothing to do with the show. Yeah, it's Acorn. And it is a product that we already pre- purchased and used on exactly. a regular basis. Yeah. Like we we're saw not... Acorn when it came out and we were like, oh, yeah. Must have. Must have. Did the same thing with Brett Box. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, but, you know, no, we're not sellouts. We're not making anything off of it, no, really. So no. it doesn't really matter. No, no, no. Um, check out those podcasts if you need to laugh. Yep. Check them out yep. uh, and let us know if you have any recommendations. I'm always looking for new podcasts to listen to. I devour them like the best cookies. And we're into the best month of the year. Happy Halloween. October! October! Yes. No matter how crazy the real world gets, it's October. If you've been with us since the beginning, you know that we do a yard full of handmade decorations every year. Yeah, we do that in our spare time. <laughs> Um, and Maybe we'll post some pictures. I posted pictures last year, and people really enjoyed them. This so theme, it's, I, this year, our theme is is monster movies. Yeah, so our theme is monster movies. So uh, we will post some pictures once we get everything up. Yeah, because so, we love Halloween. It's our Christmas, of course. So woohoo! We have crackers and presents and everything. <laughs> no, we don't. All right. And until next Jesus. time. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. The one with Nicolas Cage where he plays Billy Fury, the oh, or Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider is yeah. a zombie. He's not a zombie. He's a demon. Okay, that's not a zombie. Oh, it's close.